tests of respiratory function are referred to under the label pulmonary function testing. This could include measuring a variety of things like vital capacity or inspiratory capacity that we've studied before. The most common measure used in speech-language pathology is referred to as forced vital capacity, and within that uh, forced vital capacity procedure, the forced expiratory volume in one second. The forced vital capacity is the amount of air exhaled forcefully after a maximum inhalation. So it's not just how much air you can move, but how much gets moved when you do so uh, as quickly as possible. And the forced expiratory volume in one second is uh, the amount of volume that's moved during that first second of exhalation for the forced vital capacity procedure. Measures in pulmonary function testing are compared to norms. Deviation from norms indicates the severity of a problem. For example, for both forced vital capacity and forced expiratory volume in one second, something below 80% is considered an impairment. Um, below 70%, a moderate impairment. Below 50% uh, starts to become severe. Uh, and uh, uh, below 35% is considered a very severe impairment. So as an example, uh, we might have a standard or average vital capacity for an adult male of 5.35 liters uh, at age 75. According to our text, that's uh, 4.47 liters. Uh, we might wonder whether that effect of aging would be enough of a difference to be considered an impairment. Um, if we look at what 80% of 5.35 is, we take 5.35 and multiply it by 0.8, we get 4.28. So a value of 4.47 is a little higher than that, uh, so it's not uh, less than 80% and would be considered impaired. If we wanted to know exactly what the percentage was, uh, we could take 4.47 and divide it by that uh, 5.35. And we get 83.6% uh, roughly. When we do the forced vital capacity procedure and include in it a maximum inspiration after that expiration, so that we end up, uh, respiratorily speaking, at the same point where the forced expiration started, we have a complete breath cycle or a loop. If we use a device to track the airflow and the volume moved over that entire time, uh, we get something called a flow volume loop, like in this image in the right, uh, though it is upside down from the ones that we usually look at. Flow volume loops, uh, as portrayed in this particular text, uh, tend to look like this. We start um, uh, by a maximum inspiration um, uh, as our starting point. We then uh, exhale air as quickly as possible. Uh, typically, uh, that exhalation ramps up in terms of volume very quickly. Um, and then that volume that gets uh, moved decreases steadily over time until you reach uh, that maximum expiration point until you've uh, moved your full vital capacity. Uh, then inspiration uh, ramps up fairly quickly but levels off, uh, extends for a while before reaching um, a full inspiration again. In comparison to that, um, typical pattern we find in a loop uh, if we see um, a uh, um, less uh, aggressive uh, increase in airflow during expiration or uh, a significant bend in how that um, uh, airflow decreases in rate that can indicate um, either a re restrictive or an obstructive airflow pattern, um, uh, which indicate problems in either um, the lung part of the respiratory system or the bronchial tree part of the respiratory system. So when you look at a flow volume loop, a normal loop has a very fast rise to a peak expiration 
has a gradual decline in that expiration flow. Expiration ends near some sort of normal value for a forced vital capacity, and then the inspiration coming back uh, follows a roughly semicircular curve to close the loop. Abnormal loops can have expiration rates that level out below what is a typical peak. Uh, similarly, there could be a, a leveling out of the inspiration rate below what is a typical peak. And finally, you could have a lower than usual forced vital capacity volume, which basically gives you a, a sort of a smaller looking loop compared to a typical loop. Pulmonary function testing is carried out with a variety of devices. A spirometer is the one that's typically used for the forced vital capacity procedure. It can measure volume and flow rate directly, um, basically by exhaling and inhaling through the device. Additional measures for pulmonary function testing uh, can look at the different uh, dimensions where respiration happens. So for example, we've talked a little bit about um, the uh, chest versus the abdominal use of um, uh, respiratory muscles during respiration. That would be evaluated by respiratory kinematic analysis. In plasmography, you have um, the body in a fixed space, like for example, you could uh, submerge someone um, up to the neck in a pool of water, and then when they breathe in and expand their um, respiratory space, uh, the water would be displaced. It would rise as a result of that inspiration. It would fall again during expiration, and so you could measure changes in respiration um, based on uh, water level. And that's something that was uh, done historically quite a while back. Respiratory inductance plasmography uses bands around the thorax and the abdomen, uh, and that can um, uh, detect expansion or contraction and be used to estimate changes in lung size and also differential use of the um, uh, chest wall versus abdominal portions for breathing. Uh, a magnetometer um, uses uh, electromagnetism to determine the positions of uh, pellets uh, that are called coils within a magnetic field. This is a way without having to wrap bands around the body that you could measure uh, thoracic and abdominal expansion or contraction as part of respiration. Air pressure is measured by a manometer, a device that's similar to a microphone where air pressure moves a plate and generates an electric signal. If we have a manometer mounted in a face mask, it can measure pressures during speech production. This is how we know that typical speech production uh, requires something between 5 and 10 centimeters of H2O pressure above atmospheric pressure. And looking at the relationship between pressure and speech intensity to increase intensity by 8 or 9 dB uh, requires a doubling of that pressure. Airflow is measured by a pneumo tachometer. This uses a mesh that the air um, is pushed through and by passing through that mesh, there's a higher pressure behind the mesh and a lower pressure on the other side of the mesh. Um, and the Basically, the drop in that pressure uh, corresponds to the flow rate um, uh, of the air through the mesh. Um, using this device, we found that flow rate varies with different speech sounds and in different contexts. The flow rate is uh, fairly well correlated with uh, pressure, like pressure below the uh, larynx, for example. Um, so we also know that there are variations in uh, pressure for different speech sounds in different contexts. Airflow can be an indicator of respiratory dysfunction. For example, if you have greater than normal airflow, you may be using your breath inefficiently as part of your speech. Uh, this inefficiency in using your breath can, for example, indicate a problem with phonation rather than respiration directly. Uh, we can have excessive airflow when we have a very breathy voice, and this could be caused by um, uh, a physical obstruction, something like a polyp on the vocal fold that uh, creates a, uh, an inability to close the vocal fold. Uh, we can also find if there's a very low airflow, um, the voice may be um, too tense uh, 
in, in like a pressed voice quality. Uh, some airflow measurement devices can uh, contain a separate chamber for the oral and the nasal airflow, so a division uh, basically between the mouth and the nose inside the mask, and that can be used to look at how the velum is functioning. So if the velum uh, isn't particularly strong, or if the person has a cleft palate, you would have abnormally high nasal flow, uh, whereas normally you would expect nasal flow to be blocked off uh, during most speech sounds. If you happen to have an inadequately mobile velum for some reason, uh, or an obstruction in the velopharyngeal port, you may have abnormally low nasal flow uh, when you otherwise expect it, like for nasal sounds. In summary, we can measure a variety of aspects of airflow related to respiration. Uh, we can look at uh, what kind of volumes we have for respiration, such as with the vital capacity. We can look at the flow rate during either inspiration or expiration and related to either oral or nasal parts of speech. And we can look at pressures as to whether they're appropriate for speech. And we can look at how that airflow is achieved, for example, by kinematic analysis comparing uh, movement in the thorax versus movement in the abdomen during respiration. Each of these different measures uh, may be useful in pointing toward different uh, respiratory uh, or phonatory problems in speech production.